brother. Amen. Amen. You are welcome tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord appreciates your coming, even though there are conditions that might have prevented you. And the Lord bless your faithfulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for our leadership development. Thank you for your people here, your servants. Thank you for the servants of the Lord all over as we are connected together. We're asking, O oh Lord, your bless everyone so we can be blessings to your people, the whole congregation in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. You give a better amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Already we have read Deuteronomy chapter 16, and we have read chapter 17 too. And you will see that chapter 16 in particular speaks about the Passover. We are not strangers to the Passover. Once you glean some lessons there for our personal lives, for our leadership, and for the whole church. And so tonight we are speaking on the Passover and the purging by the purifier. Everything we've read in the Old Testament has application in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading there from verse 6, it tells us your glory is not good. It's talking about the Corinthian church. Uh, there were things in their, in their midst that were symbolized by leaven. And they were glorying. So he said, your glorying is not good. He said, know ye not that a little leaven lifteth the whole lamb. Then he tells us in verse 7, it says in verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. Underline that, Christ, a Passover, is sacrificed for us. As you look at the children of Israel, on the night that they were delivered out of the out of Egypt, the Lord said, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the Passover came. And then when they got to the Red Sea, the Red Sea was in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. How were they going to go through Passover? And the Lord opened the Red Sea and they passed over. And so you have uh, the Passover as an event, and the Passover as an experience even after that. They go to Jordan, and the priests were to carry the ark, and as they stood by the brim, by the shore of that Jordan, again, a Jordan parted, and they passed over. As you come to the New Testament, Jesus Christ, brought his own disciples in Mark chapter 4. They want to go to the other side. Again, the word, let us pass over to the other side. Jesus Christ becomes for us our Passover. At the point of salvation, Passover, we pass from death unto life. And also in our lives, generally difficulties are there, challenges are there, temptations are there, hurdles are there, mountains are there. Again, by faith, we we'll pass over. That's why we're looking at the world tonight, the Passover and our purging by the purifier. It tells us in verse 8, of that first Corinthians chapter 5, it tells us in verse 8, it says, in verse 8, it tells us, therefore, let us keep the feast. Uh, you know, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16 is talking about the feast. There is the feast of the Passover. There is the feast also of weeks and the feast of the tabernacle and it says whether it is uh, the whether it is of the passover or the pentecost that reads uh, the way we keep that feast and it says not what the leaven here is new testament not what the leaven neither what the leaven of 
malice. He tells us the henna that never honor is, is, is symbolic, is a symbol of malice, is a symbol of hypocrisy, is a symbol of insincerity, is a symbol of sin generally. And so, as we come to Christ, and He has become our Passover. We do not allow sin to remain, actually. That's the reason why he came. That's the reason why he sacrificed himself and he shed his blood. And it is that blood that makes atonement for us. It is that blood that makes us to pass from sin unto salvation. Our Passover now is from darkness to light. Our Passover now is from sin to salvation. Our Passover now is from death unto life. And it says we keep that without leaven, without the leaven of malice or the leaven of wickedness. We pass over from wickedness to tenderness. We're now tender among ourselves. The Passover should have meaning in our lives as it ought to have had meaning in the lives of the children of Israel passing over. But it says now with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We're passing over from what was dark what was sinful, what was evil, we now pass over. And Christ is a Passover, is been sacrificed for us. There are three things we're looking at in the message tonight. Number one is the Passover through the sacrifice of our substitute. As you go back to the children of Israel, all have sinned and, sh and they have come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And so, death, the death sentence was over all, both the Egyptians and the Israelites, because they were all sinners. But a substitute, a lamb without blemish was slain for the children of Israel. As they depended on that lamb, the substitute, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the same thing with us, Christ has been sacrificed for us. And that Passover lamb, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, the guilt of the world, the condemnation of the world, the death sentence for the whole world. And so we have the Passover through the sacrifice of our substitute. Look at number two. Number two is the purging from sin and self. It says purge out therefore all the leaven so that there will be no leaven and already we learn that leaven is a symbol for sin and self. And so Christ purges us from Seen and saved. Look at number three. Number three is the purifier of his saints and servants. Now it makes us saints because we are transformed. It makes us saints because we are now conformed unto the Savior. And then the servants of the Lord, he is the purifier as well. Let's come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the Passover. Through the sacrifice of our substitute. And we look at uh, the word of God as it tells us uh, once again, we're looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, where it says, Your glory is not good. Know ye not that ye little leaven? A little leaven lifted the whole lump, a little leaven. And already he tells us in the following verses there, the leaven of malice, a little malice, and the le leaven of insincerity, a little insincerity, the leaven of hypocrisy, a little hypocrisy, and the, the leaven of wickedness. A little wickedness lifted the whole lump. 
And so that means as we come to Christ and we take him as the sacrifice for our sin, as the substitute for us who have sinned and come short of the glory of God, it says a little leaven will not be allowed. For the children of Israel, a little level was not allowed. They will look at every place, every corner in their houses, and they'll sweep off and they'll take away the leaven. And for seven days, they would not eat anything that was leaven. And you know that seven is the number for completeness that he is for our whole lives the lord does not expect us that we'll be going to live little wickedness and little malice and little insincerity and little hypocrisy he tells us in first corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 it says in verse 7 it says porch out therefore therefore because we know a little leaven it's dangerous for the Christian life. A little deception, a little hypocrisy, a little falsehood is dangerous for the Christian life. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, the old lifestyle, that she may be a new lamb. We should be new through and through. We should be new completely. We should be new in the private and in the public. We should be new in our heart, in our spirit. We should be new in our mind because now the old is gone and the new has now come. It says, for even Christ, our Passover, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. If you limit the Passover to the point of salvation, you'll not get all the benefits that Christ has for us. But if you make sure that you understand that Passover, initially at the point of salvation, we cross over, we pass over. And then at the time of temptation, we pass over from weakness unto strength. At the time of sickness, we pass from disease to recovery. At the time of any challenge, we take Christ as our Passover. I'll not remain in the dark. I'll not remain in the negative. I'll not remain in my weakness. I will not remain in anything that will tie me down to this side where I used to be. But now Christ is our Passover. And he says, let us pass over to the other side. And you are going to a better side, to the higher side. And whatever storm may appear on the sea as you are passing over, you know that since Christ is there, the presence of Christ, the power of Christ will see you through in Jesus' name. Any pressure in your life, any pain in your life, any problem in your life, you will not remain there. As soon as you call on the name of Christ, Christ, don't you care that we perish a rise up there and say, peace be still, peace in your life, peace in your family, because you must pass over and you must get to this higher side in Jesus' name. It tells us in Exodus, Exodus chapter 12, where the Passover actually began. It says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Then it says, both man and beast and against all the gods, the idols of Egypt, will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. Actually, the smiting of those firstborns and of the idols of Egypt was a judgment. And the Lord, because of the substitute, they were not to be smitten. The Lord was to pass over them. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, 
and the blood shall be a pot to you for a token, for a symbol, for a sign upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, what will happen? I will pass over. That, 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 that's the word. You see those two words, pass over. The, the two words join together to make the pass over. And it says, I will pass over you. When judgment comes, it will pass over you. When condemnation comes, it will pass over you. Once again, remember the pass over here now. He passes over the people who have believed in Christ. There is going to be on the final, at the final judgment, when there will be the great white throne judgment, and all the world will be before the Almighty God. And then the, uh, the Lord will open the books, the books of records, and the book, the book of life. Thank God. Rejoice not only because these spirits are subject unto you. Rejoice because your names are written where? Are written where? Your name is written in heaven. And on that same day, because of the sacrifice of Christ and because he is our substitute, when the whole world will be judged, he will pass over you. All right? He will pass over me. He will pass over you in Jesus' name. It says, when I see the blood, not when I see your, your sweating, not when I see your old good natural works, not when I see your religion, not when I see your tradition, not when I see all the personal self-efforts you are making. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Whether somebody is there to pray for you, not there to pray for you, you are born again, you are a child of God, he has passed over you already, and judgment has passed over you. And the stripes of Jesus has provided healing, deliverance, recovery unto you. Anything that comes, remember, the Passover of the Lord was not only for that first day, first night, but all through your life, evil will pass over and you will not be drowned in the judgment of this world in jesus name and the plague shall not be upon you i think i need to claim that one the plague shall not be upon me the plague shall not be upon me to destroy me when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, remember, all through the days, those seven days, there must be no leaven found in their houses, and they must not eat any leavened bread. What does that mean for us? Leaven, leaven, leaven. Look at Matthew chapter 16. We're reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. They didn't understand. Uh, they were thinking of uh, only what they had read in the Old Testament at the time of the Passover. There must be no leaven in the house. And Jesus told them now, take it and beware that there be no leaven at all of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, How is it that ye do not understand that I spoke not, I speak it not to you of uh, the concerning the bread that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, then understood they how that he bade them 
not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. When we say there will be no leaven in our lives, there must be no leaven of false doctrine. There must be no leaven of religious Pharisees, of traditional Sadducees. We make sure that our minds, our brain, our lives are totally clear from the leaven of false doctrine. In Mark chapter 8, reading there from verse 15, and he charged them, saying, Take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. There are political ideologies that contradict the precepts of the Bible. There are political ideas and political precepts and as that contradict the words of Christ. We must understand that anything coming from the religious circle or coming from the political circle herod we must beware of imbibing all the levels of the pharisees sadducees and also of herod you know in these days of social media it is very easy to be influenced by the ideas we see there on the social media when we come to church we read the Bible, we understand the Bible, we pray by the Bible. But when we go to social media, all the leaven of Herod, all the leaven of the political class, their ideas and their statements and their thoughts, we must still see that we compare with the Bible so that the leaven of Herod does not slip in unto us. We're looking at Luke chapter 12 and we're reading from verses 1 and 2. In Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 1, in the meantime, when they were gathered together, a such an innumerable multitude and it says and the people of the people is so much that they trudge on one another that he Christ savior our substitute and our sacrifice began to say unto his disciples first of all beware of the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy hypocrisy and you find among the Pharisees in fact Jesus told them over and over and over ye hypocrites and then another verse ye hypocrites and he told us why he was calling them hypocrites because they made the outside of the sepulchre wide but inwardly, they were full of corruption. They have not come to Christ to take the inward corruption and inward feels, filthiness away from them. But outwardly, on their Sabbath day, they will act dignified. And it says, the leaven that we're talking about so that we're totally free from the leaven is the leaven of hypocrisy so that we're not putting out a good front a clean front when on the inside we are dirty he wants us to be free of the leaven of the pharisees which is hypocrisy and hey, look at this and hey, look at the next but there in verse 2 in verse 2 he says for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither heed that it shall not be known. I pray the Lord will so cleanse our lives, there will be no hypocrisy, there will be no leaven of any kind in our lives in Jesus' name. I'm sure you can say a better amen. amen. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the purging from sin 
and self. As we come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 7 again, and notice the word purge. The very first word there, purge out therefore. Yes, Christ has done his part. He has sacrificed himself for us. He has shed his blood for us. And we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. When I see the blood, not your tears. When I see the blood, not the fasting. Fasting is good, but we're talking about to get saved. We don't need fasting to get saved. We don't need, uh, you know, to go to the riverside to get saved. Anywhere you are, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why? Because of his blood. Yet, after he has shed his blood, and we apply the blood in our heart, you must now purge out Therefore, the old lemon, that ye may be a new lamb, and then as ye are on leaven, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not what the leaven uh, neither with the leaven of malice. Uh, in the past, you know, when we were unbelievers, especially when you cannot retaliate, you don't have the power, you don't have the strength to retaliate and revenge and beat up the other fellow. The first thing is, all right, I will not talk to you. I will not greet you. I will hold malice. If we saw anything good coming to that person, that's not my business. If any bad thing happens to him, after all, he did me evil. Uh, you know, the young people will say, he wicked me. He did wickedness to me. Let anything happen to him. He says, now we have passed over all that. I have passed over. <laughs> you know, sometimes when these young people, when they get married, after the, you know, the courtship and the honeymoon, they come back to the house now, and maybe the lady did something. The boy, the young man, sorry to say, has forgotten himself, and he will not talk to her. Maddie's. But you know, as we pass over, as we're children of God, the same love at the time of courtship. Why don't you bring in that same love? After all, there were times she offended you or he offended you at the time of courtship. Why don't we continue to make sure there is no leaven, a little leaven of money so that, you know, you don't turn your face that way and turn your face that way. Like Ahab, when Naboth said, I cannot give my vineyard unto you. He came back home, he will not eat. Old man, a king, and he turned his face to the wall. Malice, you know, now that we're cleansed and now that we're forgiven, no malice again in Jesus' name. And wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Uh, that's where we are now. That's the way we live now because the purging has been done by the Lord himself from sin and from self. Hebrews chapter 1, we're looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, reading from verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and uh, the express image of his person is talking about Christ and he says, and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. By himself, without our helping hand, by himself, 
is blood alone without the holy water from Jordan or from Jerusalem by himself purged our sins. And then he tells us there is such dam on the right hand side of majesty on high. He is the one that has purged us and if he purges anyone, that person is clean. If he has put you, then you are clean. Amen. In the sight of God, purged, clean. In the sight of the angels, purged, clean. In the sight of Christ himself, purged and clean in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 9, we're reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9. We're reading from verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ? You see that? That's what purges us. That is the uh, means by which we're purged. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself for without spot to God, Purge, purge, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It purges our conscience. It's not just purging our external body. Yes, yes, our external body. If there is skin disease, it'll purge that skin disease. If there's leprosy, it'll purge that leprosy. That skin disease will not be in your life anymore. And then internally, internally, the guilt, the condemnation that we carry in the heart, the heaviness we carry in the heart, because of what we had done and the devil will keep on saying look at you look at you look at you i am saved uh-huh but look at you i am born again but look at you all that accusation of the devil that has been weighing our conscience down the purging of christ will take everything away you didn't say good amen and then we're told in verse 15, look at verse 15, it says in verse 15, and for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, the New Covenant, by, that by means of his death for the redemption, for the cleansing, for the remission of the transgressions that were under the false testament day which are called might receive the uh, promise of the eternal inheritance and i pray those promises will work mightily in our lives in jesus name and we're reading from second uh, um, timothy chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 21 second timothy Chapter 2, verse 21, we have a part to play. Now as servants of God, as children of God, we have a part to play. If a man therefore purge himself, uh, you look at your life and you match your life with the messages we're hearing. And you say, that looks like a little leaven. That looks like, you know, a stain from my past life that is still attaching itself unto me. That attitude, you know, when they say somebody has attitude, something has happened, even though he will not talk, even though she will not say anything, will find attitude. And attitude, you don't understand, can show on your eyeballs. When somebody looks at you, he can tell there is attitude, there is temper, there is anger, there is a kind of disposition that shows from the face all that. Those things we ourselves, we need to take care of a, a little kind of, uh, you know, setback 
okay, I will not, you may not say it with the word of mouth, but I will not help again. I will not preach again. I will not evangelize again. I will not do soul winning again. Attitude, attitude. I said, I will not speak the word of God again. But the word was like fire inside my bones, and I could not stay. When you see that there are some little, little things like attitude, little, little things like temper, little, little things like a, a hidden anger, bottled in anger. And you see that, no, this is like leaven. This is malice. This is wickedness. Then it says, you yourself, if a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Is that purging? Is that cleansing that prepares us for better work and greater work in the kingdom of God? The Lord will not leave you alone until everything that will hinder your ministry will be pushed away in Jesus' name. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, that's love, agape love, peace with them that call on the name of the Lord. They call on the Lord out of a pure heart out of a pure heart no impurity in the heart no lust in the heart no jealousy in the heart no envy in the heart no hidden hatred in the heart but the heart is pure and purified then he tells us in verse 23 look at verse 23 but foolish and unlearned questions avoid why because that's also level he's saying avoid that because we purge out the old level meaningless questions questions that are to trip the person we're asking the question from questions that actually we intend to recall to bring guilt and condemnation uh, to him and so we bring it in the form of a question or it may be uh, during the service that you think about it you size up the leader who is uh, leading us for that service and uh, you just want to jolt him you want to destabilize him. You want to ridicule him in the presence of the whole congregation of his children. And then anyone having any question there and keep to what we learned today, then you raise up your hand innocently. Then you are called and then you ask a question like a bombshell upon in the congregation it says that's part of the level that's part of the attitude and that's part of the style that we have been employing to destabilize the congregation foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do greater uh, the, uh, the gender strives anything that will bring strife anything that will bring commotion avoid them because it's the level that we are to purge out of our lives of our family of our congregation look at verse 24 in verse 24 and the servant of the lord must not strive the servant of the lord the preacher of the gospel the apostle the prophet the evangelist the teacher the pastor must not strive and the strive must not emanate from you must not come from you why because you are poor 
and because you are purging yourself from every form of leaven uh, you must not say anything that will provoke Moses and Moses will carry the rod and the provocation has made him to forget what the Lord said go speak to the rock but these uh, children of Israel they have not cleansed themselves from the leaven of provocation and so Moses got there and he took the rod and said ye rebels well they were rebels must we bring water out of the rock for you and eventually he struck the rock two times and the people drank water but the leaven of provocation had done its evil work and thank god he got to heaven i said thank god moses got to heaven amen. give me a good amen, amen. but the lord said canaan you're not get there. He prayed, he fasted, and he was importunate. The Lord said, don't talk about that thing anymore. Leaven is dangerous. And so we mustn't allow all that kind of leaven, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth look at verse 26 in verse 26 and that they may recover themselves out of the hand of the snare of the devil you know all those uh, people backsliding people provocative people attitudinal people the people that have stormy temper they give themselves under the snare of the devil but two wrongs will not make a right that fellow there is manifesting bad temper and now the pastor the preacher, the leader, are <laughs> acting like that. He too is provoked, and uh, the grace of God kind of leaks out of his life. He too speaks provocative words, and it's like they're tangling. How do they say it now? He is fighting, you are fighting. Strive. The servant of the Lord must not strive. We will not strive in Jesus' name because it's the leaven that the Lord has told us to purge out, but we shouldn't join the people who are taken captive at the will of the devil. But thank God, he purges us. He will purge you. I said he will purge you. Guilt, he'll purge that away. Condemnation, he'll purge that away. Look at Psalm 51. We're looking at verse 7. Psalm 51. We're looking at verse 7. Purge me with Aesop, and I shall be clean. David knew why he was telling the Lord. We even know what had happened. A time of carelessness, a time when he saw somebody accidentally, but now he looks at that person intentionally. Accidental, uh, we can, you know, as you go through life, as you go through the streets, we will see things accidentally. That's not your fault. A bird flying over your head. That's not your fault. But when you gaze on that thing, when you have the magnet in your inner man that magnetizes your eyes, your gaze, your look on that forbidding object, and that now arouses something in you and you give expression to the arousal that calls from you 
you become guilty. Terrible leaven, heavy leaven has now come in your life. And so he came, he said, have mercy on me, O Lord. He said, before you have I done this sin. And he felt, he knew he was guilty. Thank God for feeling guilty. The pain of guilt when you have done something wrong. A person that doesn't have pain, that's dangerous. You can cut yourself. Your hand doesn't have any pain. Your body doesn't have any pain. You can injure yourself, even kill yourself, because you don't feel any pain. But pain is good because of the pain that alerts you that something has gone wrong. He felt the pain, but he will not remain in that pain. And he said, Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. We shall be clean in Jesus' name. Wash me now. Uh, David could have gone to Jordan. He, had, he knew the way to Jordan. David could have gone for holy water somewhere. That one doesn't wash anybody. David could have asked for oil. He knew about oil. He could have gone for oil. That one will not purge. All these things that, you know, uh, religious people carry about, bottle of water, it doesn't purge the heart. It doesn't purify us. But David knew all those things will do nothing. And so he said, purge me was talking to God with Esau, and I shall be clean. He says, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. A good, good amen. amen. You know, we can be as white as snow. We can get saved. We can be whiter than snow. We can get sanctified. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God answered his prayer. God will answer your prayer. We're coming to point number three here. Point number three is the purifier of his saints and his servants, the purifier of his saints and his servants. We're coming to Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 3. Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 3. And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier. That's Christ. He, Christ. When he comes, he will siege as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Those were the laborers in the kingdom, in the vineyard of the Lord. Referring to us, you and I. And it says, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Tonight, today, the purifier is still at work. It's at work on me. It's at work on you. And it'll wash you, purge you, whiter than snow in Jesus' name. If anything has happened, that will make us some feet for the service of the Lord. Praise the Lord Christ. The purifier will purify every one of us as we believe, having faith in Him. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He is the agent. He is the performer. He is the active one that does that, purifying our hearts by faith. And he puts no difference. 
he forgave Peter after Peter denied him he'll forgive you too he'll forgive us too he forgave James and John uh, with their temper stormy temper let's call them fire upon the people you don't know of what spirit you are of you are and he purified them he puts no difference what he has done for them he will do for us he will do for you he'll purify everyone in jesus name titus chapter 2 reading from verse 13 in titus chapter 2 Reading from verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for the appearing of Christ at the time of the rapture. We will not look in vain. As you are looking for his coming, it will come. He will take all of us home in Jesus' name. He says we're looking for his appearing. And then in verse 14, who gave himself for us. Praise the Lord. Uh, do I realize that if there's something to cleanse, he gave himself for us. Do I realize that if there's any stain, if there's any spot, if there is anything that he needs to take away, do I realize he's done that for me, he's done that for you, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify that's his work and purify that's what he is eager to do that more than you are eager to be purified he is more eager to purify you it says and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works zealous of good works uh, you know sometimes as a believer as a saint of god as a servant of the lord in the past you ran running to do the work of god you are passionate you were passionate you were zealous you were on fire you were fervent. but what happened that you are slowing down now maybe you are discouraged now Maybe the interest is just not there like it used to be there. And you cannot run and climb the mountain like you used to climb the mountain. And the way is rough. And you are now going slowly and slowly, not like you were doing. The fire from the altar will come again. And all those things that clouds your vision, all those things that disturb you and no zeal anymore, zeal will come back. Passion will come back. And you will run the race with perseverance in your life in Jesus' name because he will purify you unto himself a peculiar sage a peculiar servant zealous of good verse 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god it was any time we need to pursue, we need to possess the purity of heart. It is now. Look at all the things happening. Christ is about to come. And if there was any time we emphasize purity of heart, there's the time to emphasize purity of heart. And the Lord said, Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. We shall see God. After all these days of Christ, we must see God. After all this passion and purposeful drive, and we have been serving the Lord, we must see the Lord. You will see the Lord. Look at Psalm 24. We're reading from verse 3. The question. 
The question is, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Look at the answer. It says, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. If um, you discover your hands are not clean enough, let's come to the Lord. He will cleanse us, everyone, in Jesus' name. If you discover you are battling, you are struggling with that impurity, and you're trying to shake it off, shed it off, and it's still there. Tonight, the Lord will purify every heart, purge every life, and make us ready for higher service in the Lord in Jesus' name. The Lord is all for you. His sacrifice is all for you. His purging is all for you. And His performance of all promises, they are all for you tonight. They are for me. They are for me. Rise up and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. He is the Passover lamb. He is the one that purges and purifies. He is a purifier. Call upon him. He will answer your prayer. He will answer our prayer.